Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I have the most awesome person with me. Can anyone guess who it is? I mean, I can because I'm sitting looking at the introduction, but I feel like unless he speaks now, it's not going to work, is it? But <laughs> you can tell it's no. on Monday morning, can't you? Oh, it's brilliant. We've got Caleb Howells back today. So he's been on before to talk about King Arthur and we had a lot of fun. Uh, Caleb is an author and historian who specialises in investigating myths and legends from around the world and connecting them to historical events and people. And he's here today to talk to us about a new book, which is The Trojan Kings of Britain. Hello, Caleb. Hello. Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, it's brilliant to have you back. Should we just, I just want to start straight away because I want to know all about this because I obviously when I think of Trojan, I think of Greece. So let's start with Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, what are the problems with the history of the kings of England, which I'm not going to try and pronounce in the Latin because I will fail and look stupid. That's okay. I, I probably don't pronounce it right either. I, I just say the Historia Region Britanniae, but I have no idea if that's actually how it's pronounced. But yeah, so he wrote in about the year 1137, and he tells a story about what happened in Britain, going as far back as about the time of the Trojan War. So obviously there's a big problem right away. He was writing a long, long time after the events that he's supposedly describing. So like with any document, that's a problem. First thing in my head is he doesn't have Wikipedia or anything, does he? I mean, does he even have sources, do we know? Well, that's a bit of a controversial topic. So he claimed that he'd been given... Uh, a well, he said he described it as a very ancient book in the British tongue, so some old book written in maybe Welsh or Breton. Uh, he claimed that he was just translating that, but no one's ever found this book. There aren't other documents proving that he was given this book. Uh, so some people think that Geoffrey was just making that up, and that actually he was just using whatever sources he had that he could find and then just putting them together and then just making up the rest. Now, obviously, if he was just making up the rest, that would be an even bigger problem. Do you know what? All I think of of him writing this book is this this guy that was in my uni class when we did the exact same period when you're an undergrad first year and they make you waffle around historiography and stuff. And we were looking at one of those monks that did it. And when we got to write the essay about it, He filled his room with straw and wrote by candlelight and basically tried to zen the moment of a 12th century (laughs) monk. And now I'm picturing (laughs) Geoffrey of Monmouth with straw all over the floor trying to write this. It's not, it's still history. Just because we can't trust a source doesn't mean that that source and what they produce doesn't exist, does it? So it's a difficult one. So is it a case of just taking it with a pinch of salt? I mean, there's a very good chance, I suppose, that... I mean, we we lost quite a lot of ancient stuff, uh, didn't we, when Henry VIII went around burning it in uh, monasteries and trashing it if it wasn't worth any money to him. So um, how do you feel about his sources? Well, I think that it's very clear from what he wrote, it's very, very clear that he was using native Brythonic sources. He wasn't looking at the contemporary Roman documents that he had available maybe in libraries like... Julius Caesar's account. I think it's very clear he wasn't using things like that. He was using the native British traditions. For example, uh, there's the successor of Cunobelinus. So the successor of Cunobelinus was Togodumnus. He was a king active in the southeast of England, and he was the one that the Romans encountered when they invaded uh, in 43 CE. So we know from contemporary accounts that this Togodumnus was the eldest son of Cunobelinus, the previous king. 
And we also know that Togodumnus ended up dying very early on in the, in, in the invasion, one of the very first battles against the Romans. Now that's, that corroborates what Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote. He described the eldest son of Cunobelinus succeeding him, becoming king, but then dying pretty much immediately in the Roman invasion. So that checks out. But the name that Geoffrey gives this king isn't Togodumnus, it's Guiderius. Now, it is possible to see how Guiderius could have been an evolution of the name Togodumnus. For example, it wasn't uncommon in medieval manuscripts or oral tradition for the first part or the last part of a name to be clipped. So if you take off the first syllable of Togodumnus, you're left with Godumnus. And then you can see how through gradual corruptions, either through scribal corruptions or through word of mouth, that could evolve into Guidarius, especially because it wasn't uncommon for an R and an N to be swapped around. But the problem is that that requires probably centuries of corruptions, centuries of oral or written corruptions, to get from Togodumnus to Guiderius. If Geoffrey was just using the manuscripts that we have, like the contemporary Roman ones, then why did he not just call him Togodumnus, as his name clearly was? Why did he call him something so different and yet evidently related? To me, that shows clearly that this account, at least, uh, is a genuine British tradition that's that had existed for centuries before being written down by Geoffrey of Monmouth. So this, I would say, is clear evidence of an independent tradition not derived directly from the Roman accounts. So I'd say that's a, a valuable source. That's just one example, but there are many others where Geoffrey clearly shows that he's not taking the information from the manuscripts that we know, He's, taking, he's using traditions that have clearly evolved for hundreds of years, yet in many key respects they're corroborated by the contemporary sources, showing that they are historically reliable, at least in general terms. So I would say Geoffrey uh, should be given more weight than he usually is. So he's not a complete charlatan, is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that he was being honest when he said he was uh, translating uh, a document that he was given. I think that that's yeah. what the weight of evidence suggests. I suppose the further back you go, though, um, the more problematic it becomes. And I think we're trying to match up today, aren't we, um, Britain's history with the Trojan War. But the Trojan War has its issues as well, chronologically, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. So Geoffrey describes how the uh, a few centuries, are, not a few centuries, a few generations after the Trojan War, this descendant of a prince of Troy called Brutus uh, sails to Britain. So that poses a problem because, well, how are you going to investigate the origin of that unless, you, unless you're sure when the Trojan War was supposed to have taken place and thus when Brutus was supposed to have lived? See, like, like I mentioned in my book, I use this comparison. That if, uh, suppose archaeologists far in the future decided to try to investigate the uh, the origin of, let's say, stories about the Normans invading England. But suppose somehow they end up misdating the Norman invasion by several hundred years. So they place it several hundred years further back in time than it really happened. So they look in that era where they think it took place, and they don't find any evidence of it. Obviously, they'd, they'd assume that it never happened because they've got the date wrong. So if the same thing has happened with the Trojan War, then then it would only be natural to think that the Trojan migration to Britain never happened. Obviously, you're not going to find evidence of it in an era in which it didn't happen. I mean, you've come up with a really interesting point there, because there are many conflicting problems about dating the Trojan War. Have we found a solution for this at all? There are different ways of looking at it, because looking at and just what uh, Homer wrote, some people focus on certain details more than others. And that's partly responsible. It's largely resp responsible for the conflicting views. Um, so it, in some parts, Homer describes in the Iliad, he describes how the weapons were made of bronze. And so people focus on that, saying, oh, it must have occurred in the Bronze Age. 
But then on the other hand, he talks about other um, other things which you could use as chronological markers. Like, for example, he gives a lot of prominence to Argos and also Sparta. Sparta was the kingdom of Menelaus, the brother of Agamemnon. And Argos didn't become prominent. It didn't become the most prominent uh, city-state in its region until about the 8th century BCE. And regarding Sparta, that didn't even exist in the Bronze Age. So the traditional date of the Trojan War places it in about 1200 BCE in the Bronze Age or the Mycenaean era. But a lot of the details that Homer mentions, just generally the political situation that he describes, like with the prominence of Argos and Sparta and other kingdoms elsewhere, like the kingdom of Phrygia in Anatolia, uh, all these things point far more um, precisely towards the, the time of Homer himself, more or less the Iron Age, or the Archaic Era of Greek history. So you've got these conflicting bits of information. Some people say that the answer to that is that this legend of the Trojan War originated in the Mycenaean, the Mycenaean era, and then it, well, it was transmitted orally for centuries before being written down by Homer, or maybe composed in its final form by Homer, and then written down sometime afterwards. And so you've got details from various different eras that were drawn in as the as the centuries went on, as this story was told over the centuries. So that's why you supposedly have these things from different eras all in one poem. That's one explanation. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily the best or most necessary or most convincing explanation Another explanation, which was argued for extensively by a scholar called Hans van Wies, he wrote uh, an article, a two-part article called The Homeric Way of War, which is very good, very comprehensive. And he argues that all these uh, supposedly more ancient details, like the, the bronze weapons, for example, and the very, very long spears, he argues that those aren't authentic details from the Bronze Age, which were uh, preserved or brought in as the story was being transmitted. He argues that all the details about the, the warfare that's described in the Iliad are understandable completely in the context of essentially Homer's own time. Not that they're historically accurate, but that when we understand um, how Homer was writing, he wasn't preserving strictly historical details. Like, for example, he describes weapons and armor made of other metals like gold, silver, and tin. That doesn't fit any historical era. So why would we necessarily assume that the mentions of, of weapons made of bronze must be historical? It seems more likely that to be consistent, he's just uh, he's using glorious metals to bring glory to his heroes. So he describes his heroes as using things which are very impressive and not necessarily uh, authentic to any period. So uh, as another, another example is that he describes one of his heroes as throwing a boulder with one hand. Obviously, that's not historical. That's just him <laughs> describing his his heroes in superhero superhero terms i mean you know, how is larger how than life boulder because i've thrown rocks at alina before <laughs> and i could just exaggerate you know what it was it was day <laughs> six of trekking in the desert and i believe my wife, if you mention the holocaust again i will throw rocks at you in wild iran and i did and i could go yeah she just did my head in and i lobbed a boulder at her um, <laughs> and it wouldn't be factually a lie but it might be a bit of an exaggeration do we think like that's what we're saying here yeah, exactly. Yeah, exaggerations. So he wasn't uh, authentically preserving details from the Bronze Age. He was exaggerating details that were authentic to his own time. So another example is uh, in line with this boulder thing. He describes certain spears as being very, very long. Now we know that the Mycenaeans did use very long spears, much longer than 
the Greeks used in Homer's own time. So that's been used as an example of a detail that supposedly comes from the Mycenaean era. But another equally logical interpretation of that is that it's just an exaggeration to make his characters larger than life. Like, you know, having characters who throw boulders with one hand, why wouldn't they have dramatically large weapons? I mean, there's a reason that Chris Hemsworth is sexy in Troy and it's the hammer, isn't it? You know, I never watched Troy, actually. I've never seen that film. So that goes over my head, to be honest. I just, you know what, I I wasn't watching it for any semblance of plot or anything anyway. I was only watching it to just watch him swing the hammer. So I, I think see. you have a point. So before we start talking about how this impacts Britain and, and, and how we're looking at it, so what chronology do you come down on then? My My theory is that Homer was writing about events that had occurred not too long before his own time. And there are actually a lot of ancient writers who place Homer just shortly after the Trojan War. This idea that he lived many centuries after the Trojan War is, on the whole, a a fairly modern idea. Uh, The general consensus was that he lived between about 50 to 150 years after the Trojan War. Some writers even placed him earlier than that. A few even made him contemporary of the war, though I think that's not right. But uh, based on Homer's date, I would place him in about the middle of the 7th century BCE. So I would place the Trojan War around about the year 700 BCE, which is a lot later than the majority of other people, though not everyone, but it's much later than the majority of other researchers would place it. But I think that uh, that's the date which fits the weight of evidence. So we're talking about Greece. We're talking about Troy, what the hell has all of this got to do with Rome and the founding of Rome? Because somehow this chronology doesn't seem to all match up. Uh, you've got countries from either side. So- it's a mess. And I need you to explain this a little bit to me because my brain Elena's is just like, overloaded. how do we get this back to Britain? Yeah, well, yeah, it is a bit of a mess, actually. Definitely. So there's this really famous legend by Virgil in, uh, in the Iliad. Uh, And that was really popular throughout the Roman Empire. But according to that legend, uh, written in the time of Augustus, the Trojans, led by Aeneas, the prince of Troy, one of the sons of Priam, uh, he led the Trojan survivors to Rome. They went on a bit of a journey, a little bit like the Odyssey, before getting there. But the point is that eventually they ended up at Rome, and they founded this city called Alba Longa. And then... The, there were the kings of Alba Longa for several centuries, and then eventually we get to Romulus and Remus. So okay. they are presented as descendants of Aeneas after several centuries, and then they end up founding Rome in the 700s, about 753 BCE. The problem, and this really does fit what Alina said about it being a mess, uh, the problem is that when we go back, well, a lot of people assume that Virgil made up this this story, this idea that the Romans were descended from the Trojans because Augustus liked that idea, but that's not true at all. Actually, we find this legend, in essence, as far back, at least, as the mid-5th century BCE. So, for example, we see it in the writings of uh, Hellenicus of Lesbos in the 5th century BCE, and according to him, and other writers from around that time, Aeneas himself founded Rome. So he doesn't say that he founded a city several centuries before Rome, and then eventually you get Romulus and Remus. According to him, Aeneas himself was the founder of Rome. And then some other writers from around that time, or just after, uh, they give Aeneas a son called Romus, and then some others spell it Romulus. So that's where Romulus comes from. Originally, He was the direct son of Aeneas, not a descendant many centuries later. So that kind of, um, that works very well with this revised chronology that I present in my book for the Trojan War, placing the Trojan War in 700 BCE, not 1200 BCE, because that's much closer to to the traditional date for the founding of, of Rome. But again, it's still a mess. Because the the date for the founding of Rome itself seems to have been pushed back a little bit. 
you see, there are several um, activities or accomplishments attributed to the kings of Rome before it became a republic in about 500 BCE. And we can see through archaeology when those accomplishments really happened. For example, there was uh, a building called the Regia, or the Regia, not sure how you pronounce that, but it was an important building in Rome. And that was said to have been founded by a king who supposedly lived in the last uh, quarter, I suppose, the last quarter of the 700s. But based on archaeology, it seems that it was actually founded, well, archaeologists are pretty sure that it was founded in the last quarter of the 600s. So it seems that the founding of Rome itself has actually been pushed back by approximately a century based on the archaeology. So Romulus, rather than being a figure of the mid-700s, he would more logically be a figure of the mid-600s. And that works well with him being a son of Aeneas if the Trojan War, in which Aeneas participated, was an event of around uh, around 700 BCE. So that's that's what we that's the conclusion we come to based on the earliest records about these events and these people, rather than the more popular, famous um, version of the story that was presented by Virgil. The problem is that Virgil was so famous that he basically extinguished all traces of this earlier tradition. And so now it's so firmly rooted in, in everyone's minds that, that Romulus came centuries after Aeneas, even though that's not what the earliest versions of this legend actually say. Okay, how do we get to Britain then? Who is Brutus? Right, so Brutus, that's a great question. Brutus uh, was supposedly the founder of Britain. He was the descendant of Aeneas. The actual line of descent is a little bit complicated and contradictory in the sources, but he came several generations later. Now, he's first mentioned in a document called the Historia Britannum, written in Britain, in about 830. So this is many, many, many centuries after the event supposedly happened, which, like we were talking at the beginning, that's a problem. But the point is that he first appears there, and he's presented as the descendant of Aeneas, who, for some uh, some tragic reasons, he's ended up being expelled from uh, from Rome, from Italy. And then he goes and wanders around a bit, around the Mediterranean, and then he ends up going to Gaul and founds a city there, and then he ends up going to Britain, and then that's his final destination, and then he, he, fi- he founds this kingdom there, and so the Britons are descended from him. That's the story. And then we find basically the same thing, just with some variations in, uh, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's account in the history of the kings of Britain. But that's the, the basic essence of the story, that Brutus went from Italy to Britain and led uh, a group of Trojan descendants. So talking about the descendants, they actually migrate from Rome to Britain. Where is the evidence in all of this? Well, the evidence in large part, and this is actually a really, really important detail, that uh, I connect the Trojans to the Etruscans. The idea that the Etruscans migrated from, uh, from the area of Troy, it's quite well known. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that around 700 BCE, the Etruscans entered what's called the Orientalizing period. That's when we suddenly see a lot of very profound Oriental influence in the Etruscan civilization. Uh, and so that evidence combined with a whole bunch more, uh, that indicates that the, the Etruscans, the Etruscan civilization, at least from 700 BC onwards, was basically the result of the arrival of the Trojans and various of their allies after the Trojan War. So when Troy fell, they migrated elsewhere to look for a new land, hence the, the story recorded by Virgil. The, the migration was led by Aeneas. So then, once we identify the Etruscans with the remnant of the Trojans who arrived in Britain, sorry, who arrived in Italy, the the rest becomes quite easy because there's a lot of evidence for the movement of Etruscans around the Mediterranean 
Uh, and then there's a lot of evidence specifically for Etruscan, profound Etruscan influence in the land of the Celts. So remember I said earlier that according to the Historia Britannum, Brutus, wh when he left the Mediterranean, he didn't go straight to Britain. He went to Gaul, which is modern day France, and he founded a city there. So the implication is that he, it wasn't just a fleeting visit. He spent some time there. He founded a city there. Uh, and so when we look in the archaeological record, what we find in about 500 BCE, we find the emergence of the Latin culture in Gaul, in the land of the Celts. So this Latin culture, that shows profound Etruscan influence. It shows this influence in the art styles and in material culture and also the use of chariots because the Etruscans had very famous chariots along with chariot burials and the Etruscans in 500 BCE with the emergence of the Latin culture they suddenly adopted the use of Etruscan chariots and then also they employed the use of Etru Etruscan sorry they employed the use of chariot burials of the elite class which is exactly what the Etruscans did so that's just part of the evidence, but that's partially why I believe that the Etruscans migrated, or a, a group of Etruscans migrated to Gaul and basically initiated the Latin culture. That's what I interpret the emergence of the Latin culture as being. It's the this group of Etruscans arriving there, becoming the new elite class, and imposing a lot of their customs, their art style, their, their ways on the Celts at large. So I'm not saying the Celts as a whole were descendants of the Etruscans, but that this elite class established themselves over the, the Celts. I believe that's the most logical explanation for what we see, for, for the profound Etruscan influence that we see in the Latin culture of the Celts. Because with, if, we, if it was just art styles, then sure, that could, be, that could be the result of just cultural diffusion or trade. But when it's things like burial customs, I think you, you've got two options. You, well, I suppose three options. You could interpret that as being cultural diffusion, where neighbours share ideas and then it gradually spreads. Or you can interpret that as being trade, which could potentially be a lot more long distance or it could be a type of migration like a migration of an elite class so of those options which one is is the best explanation for the movement of burial customs i think all, all other things being equal burial customs generally indicate ethnicity it indicates the people who were engaged in those customs why would traders share burial customs for the elite class? Or why would, why would we see that among cultural diffusion? If it was cultural diffusion, we would expect it to be spread out from Italy to where we first see the Latin culture, but we don't see that. We actually see the sudden emergence in central Gaul of this culture, and then it gradually spreads back towards Italy, which suggests that it didn't arrive there by means of cultural diffusion, and trade doesn't make any sense. Can I ask something before we move on to the next question? So yes. could this not also be emulation? So the admiration for the way that uh, the Etruscans carry out their burial customs. Like, for example, if you look at Pompeii is a very good example. If you look at Pompeii, you have a lot of graves that belong to the rich. They're very grand. They're huge. You know, you can see that they belong to the rich. However, you also have graves that belong to freedmen who basically copied exactly what the rich were, rich were doing to make themselves seem like hey look check out how much wealth we have could it not be that kind of situation sorry i'm just being really mean here but i just i thought no, I'd that's, throw okay. that that's a mix. fair question yeah and no, that's an important question too it could be so uh, i think for me what's important is considering the the uh weight of evidence and what's the most likely explanation so it is possible to explain it through other means. But for me, I, I would think that if, the, if it was uh, admiration, 
then you'd expect it more, you'd expect this uh, emulation of the burial customs to appear first among the Celts who lived closest to the Etruscans. I mean, this is a form of cultural diffusion that I was explaining, but we don't see any trace of it for hundreds of miles between Etruria in Italy and where we see the Latin culture first emerge in central Gaul. There's no trace of it in those hundreds of miles. So I don't think cultural diffusion is uh, a good explanation for that. And I also don't think that the, the two cultures, the Celts of that area and the elite class of the Etruscans, I don't think they had established connections that were firm enough to be able to, for the elite class of the Celts to be able to know enough about the Etruscans and to be able to decide consciously to emulate what they were doing in terms of something so kind of private as burial customs. See, traders, like I said, traders could explain these long distance, uh, these long distance similarities with large gaps, with large distances between them. Traders could explain that in terms of things like art styles, but could traders be the explanation for copying burial styles? I find that unlikely. I mean, maybe it's possible, but I find it a less likely explanation than the movement of an elite class, the movement of people. So that's why I favour, I mean, plus the fact that it corresponds so well with the legend, I think that's quite a coincidence if it has nothing to do with the legend. Why would we just coincidentally see this sudden profound influence, uh, this Etruscan influence among the Celts in exactly the time that the legend says that there was this movement of Trojan descendants? So with all that combined, I think the most likely explanation is the genuine movement of some Etruscans. Do you... Th oh, I have so many questions, so many questions. I'm going to do the one that's on the list first. Do you have a theory in your head about why? Why would you leave sunny Italy and trek across Europe to France? They go, well, there's another 50 miles of water there. Let's see what's over there. I mean, I, yeah. I, obviously, I'm being glib, but I mean, like, what, what do you think motivations might be? Well, I think, first of all, from Italy... Uh, Italy was going through a very um, tumultuous period then. Uh, the, there were lots of wars between the Romans and the Etruscans and other groups. And so my theory is that Brutus and his band of men were just uh, expelled from, from Italy during that time. And so they just went searching for other lands. I don't think that they went looking specifically for Britain at all. Funnily enough, in the legend... Uh, supposedly Brutus and his men arrive at Lefkada off the coast of Greece and then they find a temple to Diana and then Brutus receives a vision from Diana telling them about Britain and how it's such a great place and that will be their new home. So obviously I, I don't think that really happened uh, but what I think is that Brutus and his men they went wandering around the Mediterranean for a while not looking for anywhere specifically but just setting themselves up where they could as a wandering band of pirates, I suppose, or something along those lines. But then when they got to the entrance of the Mediterranean, the Straits of Gibraltar, that's where we find uh, a high concentration of Phoenician traders. The Phoenicians were very active there. They kind of dominated that area. Now, funnily enough, Diodorus Siclus, he records an event that happened. Uh, he doesn't say when exactly it happened, but he says that it was when the Etruscans ruled the seas. So that would indicate about the 6th century, which is when I place Brutus. So he says that a group of Etruscans attempted to sail out of the Mediterranean to colonise some islands that were outside. And then they had a conflict with the Phoenicians and then they ended up going elsewhere, though he doesn't say what ended up happening to them. Now, I think that's an account of Brutus and his men sailing out of the uh, sailing out of the Mediterranean looking for somewhere to go. So what I think happened is that due to the interactions with the Phoenician traders in that area, they came to be aware of the amazing resources that were in northeastern Gaul. A lot of people don't know this, but just like in Cornwall, where it was a big, a major place in the tin trade, a major source of tin, 
northeastern Gaul was as well. There was a trade route that went from northeastern Gaul down uh, into the Mediterranean uh, in southern France. So I think that what happened probably was that when Brutus and his men got to the Strait of Gibraltar, they came to be aware of the amazing resources that were there and decided to go there and take over the place. And then once they were there, obviously they met resistance and uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth describes how there were wars between Brutus and his men and the native Gauls. So clearly it, it wasn't very welcoming. And so I think that's why they then moved on to uh, to Britain. And then in the archaeological record, when we look at the Latin culture, I mentioned it, it appears with its profound Etruscan influences in Gaul in about 500 or somewhere between 500 and 450 BC. We then, just afterwards, we find that culture, the Latin culture, with its chariot burials, spread to Britain. So there, there clearly was a migration from Gaul to Britain in that time among the, uh, the Latin Celts. So my understanding, my theory, is that that was the migration of Brutus from Gaul to Britain. That, that was his final step. Do you have, like, this, <laughs> I'm just going to chuck this massive overarching question, it's probably a PhD someone should do uh, in at the end, casually, like we like to do on History Hack. Um, do you have any semblance in your head from all the research you've done of how this skewed Britain's history? Do you think it set it on a completely different path? Do you have any ideas about how it changed the future of Britain? That's a great question. Uh, I had not thought of that. <laughs> so, you know, on the spot, my answer would probably be no. I don't think it made an awful lot of difference, actually, in the grand scheme of things, because... Uh, so the, the pre-Roman kings of Britain, the ones that we read about among the Catavalloni tribe, like, like Cunabellinus, the one I mentioned earlier, and the mm. others, they were descendants of the Latin Celts who had migrated there in about 450 BC and also more recent arrivals from the Belgi. Uh, so they, I mean, yeah, they definitely would have been very different. If this hadn't happened, we would see the, the Roman records about pre-Roman Britain probably would have been very different. But then the Romans took over and ruled Britain for almost 400 years. And they firmly established their culture, and that um, that really, you know, set the standard for the next few centuries. So, I think that any difference that would have existed if this hadn't happened, kind of, is negligible because of the influence that the Romans had. The Roman uh, dominion of Britain, I think, that kind of extinguished any difference that would have been there. That was like now, I can see that you're going to rabbit hole on that all day now, aren't you? That's like your entire day gone as a historian. You're going to be like, hmm, if I just look at something in that book now. It's, it's definitely an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that before. Well, that's the whole point really though, isn't it? When you get a bunch of historians together, we challenge, Alex and I challenge each other all the time. So she makes me think in a different way that I wouldn't have thought of in the first place. So I love it. I think it's a great thing. I just want to point out that the throwing rocks at you was a one-off as well. It's not like a stand <laughs> daily. <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to, so when I was a young girl, just really off, off topic, one of my friends actually threw a rock, a proper rock at me, it hit me in the face, hit me in the eye. And then I had to lie to my parents to say, no, we weren't throwing rocks at each other but someone hit me in the face to be fair i threw them at your feet to make you dance i didn't actually chuck them at you no that, no so anybody listening alex did not actually hurt me this was all in jest <laughs> just in case someone's <laughs> gonna call someone and just be like they're abusing each other in many, that's many you clarified because that's a very different view that i had in my mind <laughs> it was day six and every time we turned around she was talking about the holocaust so i just <laughs> We were marching out of the desert that morning and I, we got to the mushroom rock at Wild Hurrah and I just said, if you mention it one more time, I will throw rocks at you. And then I heard her do it and I was like, right, that's it. And I was just picking up stones off the floor basically and lobbing them at her feet. She was like, I didn't think you actually meant it. Listen, I've got no other... Sleep deprivation does to you. Oh, and freezing cold nights. 
That's true. Freezing cold nights. Listen, Caleb, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you back on today. You've got to come back. When's your next book going to be out? Because then you can come back and do that one. A bit more myth busting. I don't have any plans. It's it's such a lot of work. It's such a commitment. You know, once I start a book, imagine if I don't finish it. All that time wasted. Just, so, I know how you mean as well. It's I, like I'm not yet know. committed to the idea of writing another book. Maybe one day I will be. But not yet. You've got to wait. You've got to wait till you forget how much you hated the sight of it by the time you handed it in and never wanted to write anything ever again. I say this as someone who handed a book in a week ago. You've got to wait for that moment to subside where you're like, I never want to do this again and I hate you. And then you forget that and go, oh, maybe just one more. Yeah. (laughs) And I do have a tendency to start projects and never finish them. (laughs) Oh, dear. So I can't stop laughing at the two of you. Anyway. Caleb, we'll get you back on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was it was a pleasure. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.